when all this started, especially the rioting. And I, I simply said, I, I talked to him a lot, and I said, simply said, what is going on with these rioting?s And instantly, as soon as the last word came out of my mouth, evil will be good, good will be evil. That's, I, that's what came to me. So I ran to my scriptures, and I found it in Isaiah. Um, it's Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, but put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So we need to seek him. He'll answer our prayers, and he's an amazing God because he's there for us 24-7. And I'm just so thankful for that. I'm going to be reading out of uh, The Rebirth of America. Things that were written many years ago, but are for our day. More fitting for now than they were then. The hour is late. God's judgment is, has already begun to fall. Western civilization as we know it is clinging precariously to the thin strand of human effort and achievement. All of man's combined attempts, time, wealth, and ability alone are not adequate to hold back the destruction of our nation. We are engaged in a great spiritual battle between the very forces of heaven and hell. Human weapons will not suffice. Only divine intervention will return this nation to solid footing. Yet there is hope, hope as great as the goodness and grace of God. The sovereign ruler of the universe stands eager to manifest himself to a generation that has never clearly seen God. He is ready to extend his mercy on our behalf. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. This was written or given on April 30th, 1863. President Abraham Lincoln's proclamation for a national day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. I'm going to be reading from 2 Nephi chapter 12, verse 89 to 92. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips shall, shall slay the wicked. For the time will speedily come that the Lord God shall cause a great division among the people. The wicked will be destroyed, and he will spare his people, even if so be that he must destroy the wicked by fire, and the righteous shall be the girdle of his loins, and the faithfulness of the girdle will be his reins. This does have everything to do with seeking, and so listen carefully to these words. Which way, America? One nation under God. 
What does this mean? It means that we have this land, this flag, this government as a gift from the great God Almighty. It means that this did not become the land of the free and the home of the brave by blind fate or a happy set of coincidences, but that a wise, benevolent God was hovering over us from the very hour of conception and long before. When Columbus discovered this land, he took a cross in his own hands and planted it upon the new soil, fell upon his knees and kissing the earth, took possession of this continent for God, Faith in God hung the lanterns on the prow of the Mayflower as it charted the treacherous Atlantic. That frail vessel was laden with deathless destiny, the pioneers of a powerful nation, the heralds of a new freedoms, the trailblazers of a new epoch in human history. Later, during those difficult but decisive days of revolution, when a handful of common people won their freedom from a mighty world empire, through the crucible of a civil war, through two world wars and a number of smaller wars, through a great panic and a ravaging depression, none but the fool could fail to see the hand of a sovereign God upon this golden land of the free. But today, America faces a danger point. We must confess with troubled heart that America has forgotten God. She is rolling in luxuries, reveling in excesses, rollicking in pleasure, revolting in morals, and rotting in sin. What can we expect of a society in which passions are riderless horses? in which there is a desolation of decency, in which love has become a jungle emotion. Lust is exalted to lordship, sin elevated to sovereignty, Satan worshipped as a saint, and man magnified above his maker. Today the bleak winds of destiny are howling in protest to the way we are living. It is sheer folly to suppose that the strength and security of America lies in its vast economic resources, industrial prowess, scientific ingenuity, diplomatic skill, and military might. Our real defense as a nation rests in the spiritual convictions, character, and commitment of our citizenry. Our forefathers founded this nation upon the Christian faith, and so it will live so long as the Lord is our God. The Pilgrim Fathers left a land where they were persecuted to find a land wherein every man, through countless ages, would have the right to worship God in his own way. When these strong and stalwart champions of a new order landed, upon, landed at Plymouth Rock, they knelt upon the shore and dedicated this country to God. When the Constitutional Convention met at Philadelphia to organize the nation and write a constitution, variable old Benjamin Franklin called on the members of the convention to fall upon their knees and pray for divine wisdom. Today as of old, each of the coins of our pockets bears the inscription, In God We Trust. This same principle of dependence upon God is embodied in our national anthem. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Sin separates the nation from God. Sin separates this nation Sin separates this nation from God. But we are not without hope. I agree that the picture has a dark background, but I would like to place a crimson cross and bursting tomb and a glowing sky in the foreground. From the very throne of God, there comes this message to us. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be as red as crimson, though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. We must return to the faith of our fathers. 
We must go to our knees in humility and prayer, in contrition and confession, in repentance and the forsaking of sin. We must go back to the cross where the incarnate Son of God was cursed, condemned, crucified for man, the creature's sin. The crisis is acute. The danger is imminent. Time is running out. Something miraculous must happen in the heart and soul of America. Now before it is too late, the choice is clear. It is repent or perish, revival or ruin, Christ or chaos. The question of the hour is, which way, America? This has everything to do with seeking. The battle lines are clearly being drawn. They are. It is time for us to stand for Jesus Christ to get on our knees and beg for forgiveness and do what he wants us to do and not what we've been doing in Babylon for so many years. It will be very difficult. All we've ever known is Babylon and her financial way and every way else. We must seek him and desire his will in our life, take our place in his body. And do what we were called to do to bring about the cause of Zion. And so I beg of you to seek him and do that which is right. For not yourself alone, but the nation and your children. We are in perilous times and many things will fall upon this nation. And if we are to survive those very things, we must be the people of God. He will know if you choose him or not. He will know. You can lie to yourself, but you'll never lie to him. Never. He knows your heart, and he knows what you are willing and able to do. And I pray that we will do just that. I would ask that you would fall on your knees this morning with me, that we could pray to the good Lord and begin our journey back to him more fully than we have for many, many years. So we will sing hymn 98, and then if you'll join with me on your knees for prayer, we will conclude our service.
Would you join me on your knees, please? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we kneel before you, sinners, Lord, help us find our way in a world that grows darker each day and the snares grow thicker. That we would turn to you more fully, looking to you for all of our needs, our concerns, and our hopes. Turning to your gospel and to study, pray fast and study, to prepare for that which is to lay before us in these last days. Might we seek you with all of our heart. Might we come to you always in all hours of our days, asking what you would have us to do each and every day and every moment. Let us be your people. Let us stand for you. Let us repent of our sins and be those people you called us to be so many years ago. We have wandered and lost our way as old Israel. May we find our way once again by putting our hands in yours and saying, Take me where you would, Lord. Do with my life as you may. Thy will be done. And so, Lord, I thank you for this country and the, the places that are here that are blessed by your hands. We have been greatly blessed, Lord, and we have lived in a great land. She is faltering and crumbling and falling, but you will never fall. You will have victory. And if we want to have the kingdom and victory with you, then we must do everything you ask of us and no less. And so I pray for this people that we will humble ourselves and remember you always and take upon us your cause and your will and those things that you would have us do and not which we have done all these many years. Forgive us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Bless us, Lord. Lead us, Lord, as we seek your face. This I pray in Jesus Christ, most holy, blessed name I pray. Amen.